In part one of the presentation on complex impedance, we investigated the RLC circuit shown here. We derived a relationship between the voltage and the current in the circuit, and we noted that it was a rather cumbersome looking relationship. In particular, it wasn't easy to picture what would be the phase difference between the voltage and the current. In part two, I'm going to introduce complex versions of the current and the voltage. These complex versions will lead naturally to the idea of complex impedance and give us a clearer picture of the phase difference between the two quantities. Let's start with the current. I'm going to introduce a complex version of the current. I'll call it I hat of T. When I introduce a complex version of something for which we already have a symbol, such as I of T, the current, I'll put a hat on to indicate the complex case. I hat is just defined to be I zero times cos of omega T plus J sine omega T. I emphasize it's just a definition. Cos plus J sine, of course, could be written as cis. So that's I zero cis of omega T. And that in turn is better still written as I zero E to the J omega T. Now, I'm not claiming that there is a complex current in the circuit. We can't measure complex numbers. We can only measure real things. The point is that our actual current, I of T, is a part of this complex current. In fact, it's the imaginary part, the part with the sign in. The real part is there as well, and it's just really along for the ride. We're not interested in it. The point is, though, that using the complex structures will make the pictures look a lot easier at the end. Next I'm going to introduce three complex voltages. As before, one each for the resistance, the inductance and the capacitance. We'll put hats on those as well and we'll define them in exactly the same way as before in terms of the current, except that now instead of the real current we'll have the complex current. Let's start with VR for the resistor. It has a hat, it's complex and it's just defined as being the resistance times the complex current. We could write that as R I zero e to the j omega t. Now since the measurable quantity in all of this is the imaginary part of I hat, the measure, measurable part of the voltage here would be the imaginary part of this quantity. So it'll still come out to be R I zero sine omega t as before the real part will still be of no interest. Let's repeat the procedure for the L. For VL we have L di hat by dt. But now we're differentiating an exponential. Differentiating e to the j omega t pulls down a j omega. And apart from that leaves the exponential unchanged. So there's our complex voltage for the inductance. Once again, the measurable quantity would be the imaginary part of this. If you were to work out the details, you would notice that the j in the middle of this expression causes us to pick a cos rather than a sine now, which is exactly what we would expect from part one of this presentation. Let's carry on and do the capacitance. That's 1 over c integral i0 e to the j omega t dt and now when we anti-differentiate the exponential it becomes the same exponential but we have to divide by the coefficient of t which is j omega. Now I hope you remember j squared is negative 1 and we could cross multiply that and write j is negative 1 over j or 1 over j is the same as negative j. And so the 1 over j in this expression could be written as negative j. And then the rest is the same. OK. At this stage, what did we do in part 1? We said the combined voltage is the sum of the three voltages. Let's do that here. 
we define our V hat, our complex voltage, to be VR hat plus VL hat plus VC hat. In part one, you may recall that at this stage we separate it into sine and cosine terms. What's going to happen here though is that we just have exponentials everywhere, e to the j omega t. The separation is going to come in to the real and imaginary parts. So we get i0 as an overall coefficient. We get e to the j omega t outside. And for the resistance part of the voltage we got just r i0 so that's the real part. And then both the other terms, the L part and the C part, have J's in. Here's the L part. It's J times L I0 omega. So let's write J. The I0 is there already. So that's L omega. And then for the capacitance part, that's up here. We've got minus j, so minus 1 over omega c. Now I0 multiplied by the exponential is just the complex current, so we could write v hat is now a quantity z times i hat, and the quantity z is just the quantity in brackets here. Z is so where R plus J L omega minus one over omega C. Written this way, V equals constant times I. This looks very much like Ohm's law, except that it's a complex version of Ohm's law. For that reason, we call Z the complex, and we don't call it the resistance, because the resistance suggests just a resistor. Z is the summary of all the resistances, of the resistor, the capacitor, and the inductance. So we call it the impedance. So it's the complex impedance. Z is a very useful quantity. Its real power comes in the representation of complex numbers in polar form. Let's do that for Z. First of all, mod Z. That's just the sum of the squares of the real and imaginary parts, and take the square root. So it's R squared plus L omega minus 1 over omega C, all squared. This quantity is the overall magnitude of the resistance felt in the circuit due to all the three components. It's just possible you've seen this expression somewhere before. If it looks familiar, it might be because you've previously solved second order differential equations for the RLC circuit. This quantity appears in the solution to the auxiliary equation for those second order DEs. Anyhow, if that doesn't mean anything to you, it's of no importance. The point is that this is the overall magnitude of the impedance. Z of course also has a phase. We call it phi. And it's the argument of Z which is the inverse tan, as usual, of the imaginary part divided by the real part. Written this way, we could now express v hat as mod z e to the j phi times i hat. Writing i hat in its polar form again, we have mod z i0 e to the j phi e to the j omega t, which is mod z i0 e to the j omega t plus phi. And there is the magic, because now we can see 
that the argument for v hat is phi larger than the argument for i zero for for i hat. Okay, so if for example phi is positive, then the v hat is ahead or leads i hat by the amount phi. Similarly, if phi is negative, then the v hat would lag behind the i hat. This leading or lagging is true for all t, but we could draw it for a particular case when t is naught. So, for example, for t equals zero, we could do an argand picture in which we have the i hat now e to the naught is 1 so i hat would just be i0 so just pointing along the real axis but the v hat has omega t plus phi omega t is 0 at t equals 0 but there's this extra quantity phi so the v hat has magnitude mod z i0 and it has a phase angle phi compared to the i hat. We see now why the complex numbers are so useful. It's because when we do multiplication in polars, the angles add. And that makes it very clear to picture how the v is ahead of the i, or in the case of negative phi, how the v is behind the i. Remember though that Whenever we actually want to measure a quantity, we would have to take the imaginary part. The real part is of no relevance.